everyone, this is Fashion Knowledge and my name is Bata Vinchuk. I am a Berlin-based critical fashion practitioner and I work across education, research and strategy. I lecture on fashion, design and digital cultures and I run a consultancy and research laboratory called Unfolding Strategies. In each episode, together with my students and fellow researchers and practitioners, we discuss the fashion's most urgent issues and try to reimagine the socially just, sustainable and digital fashion futures. Hi, and welcome to the new podcast of Fashion Knowledge. Today, our guest is Marjorie Hernandez. She is a Caracas-born architect, strategist, and innovation expert. Her career oscillated within developing ideas and concepts for globally renowned artists, creative agencies, and one of the big four. Before founding Luxo, an Ethereum-based blockchain for the design and fashion industry, Hernandez established and managed Ersen Young's Digital Innovation Lab in Berlin. As the Digital Transformation Strategy Executive, Hernandez collaborated closely with Ethereum and the IOTA Foundation. To converge and nurture the emerging digital fashion ecosystem, Hernandez co-founded V Dematerialized, powered by Luxo Experimental Market Space for Fashion NFTs. Throughout her work, Marjorie Hernandez explored ideas and advantages coming from the junction of design and technology. With her form and innovation-driven reasoning, Marjorie became a transformation leader in the tech fashion environment. As a co-founder and managing director of Luxo, Hernandez is a strong female voice disrupting blockchain and creating new use cases across creative economies. Welcome, Marjorie, and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Beata. What an amazing introduction. I'm very flattered. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, oh, you know, happy to have you here. And I'm flattered that we have this opportunity to talk about all things fashion and digital today. So yes. I would like to start our conversation with like a little background. We met about two years ago as I was starting uh, research for my PhD, and I was very interested in digitals. What at the time was rather a new word, now we're kind of more used to it. Uh, I also came across your Luxo white paper where you discuss it quite in detail. And uh, for those who don't know, digital can be an object, a thing, a product that exists both physically and digitally. Uh, some also use it as a noun. Now we're kind of more used to it. And for me, it's amazing how much has changed and developed in these two years. And today I hope that we can talk about these developments, how everything forwarded, because I think it's one of the topics that's very important for fashion knowledge podcast. I really, really believe that it's very important for people working with fashion to learn and reflect also critically on digital, blockchain, fashion entities, et cetera, all those things that you're expert in. Because what I observe in my work is that there's a lot of excitement or fear. So there's this, those kind of two radical perspectives. People either totally reject it, as in not my thing, I prefer the things old way, or I super hyper optimistic in a way like, oh, I can't wait to hang out with you and Metaverse and work close together. My personal position is more informed by curiosity. I prefer to observe everything, kind of try to you know, investigate with the new applications, uh, but also critically reflect on its social impact and so on. But what is certain to me that these new developments should be included when teaching fashion, either at schools, universities, or on these really levels, because fashion workers really need to catch up and it's not easy. So that's why we're here today to talk about it. Yes. And I would really like us to unpack digital wardrobes, fashion NFTs, and how we will wear clothes in multiverse or metaverse. This is also a question to you, which word is better? What do they mean and why? So maybe you could start telling me a little bit about what you do at Luxo. Amazing. Well, so cool. And I, I remember when we met two years ago, and I think I'm, I'm very happy that we met. I think it uh, was one of my uh, favorite encounter, first encounters I had with a person. We had a very good conversation. And we have progressed since then, always have, having really good exchanges. So I'm very happy about that. So, yeah. So multiverse or metaverse. I think, you know, the definition of the world Metaverse is kind of like evolving in a way, my personal definition and kind of like within Lux, so we see the metaverse as basically just the internet breaking out from that um, two-dimensional barrier that we're used to so far, by understanding that we experience the internet only through two-dimensional surfaces. And that's kind of like the end of it, right? And that we are always like using some kind of external device in order to access uh, the internet. And I think, um, that vision for the metaverse is 
when the internet becomes even more and more ubiquitous and the experiences are more and more immersive and we have a juxtaposition of the the real reality is juxtaposed with this new reality dimension that we are putting on top um it's going to be the metaverse right so i think when people talk about games and etc and i think the reason why we use the word metaverse and we don't use the word computer games uh to refer to this to this kind of like to this place uh, we're heading towards is because computer games are like a place you go and leave while rather um the metaverse will be a continuous experience that potentially is always there. Um, so I think that would be the, the, the biggest, the biggest kind of like a differentiation point. And in terms of the multiverse, when we as blog, so we we were referring earlier to the multiverse, I think is um was an attempt to define like again in our white paper, we use very often this term around different reality dimensions in terms of experience, in terms of uh, of knowledge and access about a product, about about um, a brand, about an institution, about a person, etc. So I think it's having so many different layers of information that some of them might be in this metaverse vision, and you might have different like parallel metaverses maybe happening at the same time. But I think this is something that we have to to revisit because I think we have we have progressed so much in the in the conversation around the metaverse. Um, the last couple of the last year and a half that I think maybe the the multiverse might be outdated a little bit but let's see or maybe yeah maybe metaverse already contains multiverse and multiverse contains metaverse yeah there is like oh I like that there's this word in philosophy like there's this word in general which is called default but there was one French philosopher that he said that everything, you know, the fold contains multitudes and everything is folded and fold is a fold is a fold. In a way, it's like a rose is a rose and a rose in a poem. So in the sense, you know, that there are systems that kind of uh, collapse in themselves and they contain multitudes. Anyway, oh, this wow. is for That's awesome. a poetry reference. So, okay, so what Amazing. do you, how Luxo is a part of shaping those you know what we call metaverse or how we can exist in those uh i don't know different kind of type of spaces in future amazing yeah so when we started Luxo, it's funny enough it was 2017 which feels like a million years ago um especially given the latest cultural phenomena that we have been experiencing but when we started Luxo, our white paper it was one of the first things that we did we worked nine months on it um, we gave it the title of blockchain for new creative economies. So we envisioned how we could take blockchain technology and move away from that kind of like, you know, DeFi, finance driven kind of like narrative. Blockchain technology was trapped back then. And kind of like how we will use the technology to power an infinite array of creative applications in which potentially and very likely we're going to have this economy existing in parallel to the current economy and it's an economy that is powered 100 percent by cultural goods cultural goods being either you know uh art work a fashion product digital fashion product a digital piece of any type of creation music art whatever it might be um existing as unique identities on chain or as we know as uh, today as nfts what we call nfts um and then having that economy and then Fabian and I, we gave ourselves the task of what are the key pieces of technology? What are the key elements that are missing that need to be built and need to be created in order to empower people who are very creative, who are uh, create, putting uh, you know, a cultural output out there, but they don't necessarily know how they, they're not developers. And you know, at that point in time and still today, blockchain technology can be quite daunting because it is, you know, everything people don't understand about the internet with everything people don't understand about money, right? That's a, a quote from John Stewart. So I think um, I think that's that's the biggest challenge. So when we started, was basically a process of simplification and creating an user journey and that experience that just basically giving the tools and make putting it in the hands of, of, of the creators. So that's what Luxo is in okay. a philosophical description. <laughs> if we jump out from, uh, you know, creative production and we go narrow it down to fashion how is particularly yes. so engaged with fashion how, how is it what 
yeah, how is what you do engaged? Like, how is it kind of, like, oh, yeah. let's take it from this macro perspective of cultural creative economy yes. to something, I don't know, rather more tangible, simple, and commonly not very digital, which is fashion. Yeah, amazing. So I think, you know, the first, the first thing, and one of the first topic, obviously, was the, the topic around the digital, which is that uh, physical product they kind of like evolves and has this, this digital identity, this digital twin, this digital representation. And then that digital uh, identity holds all kind of information around the product from you know, where the product came from to where the product has been and then continues to record data and information in the future. Meaning that you have like a very clear and a tangible kind of like story around the product. So that will be the way we saw it and we still see it is when you have a physical product without a digital identity, it's like basically having an iPhone without a battery. It's just you are missing like 90% of what it is. And I think, you know, the fact that we, we appreciate beauty and the craftsmanship around like fashion products and handbags and accessories and stuff like that, we appreciate it. But I think uh, the times when we are satisfied with walking in the store and leaving, and that's it. I think they're gone. We want to know more about it. What is what makes these products amazing and valuable? If the story behind it is the heritage behind it, is the people who made it, the parts that constituted. So I think having that information in a way that is tangible and verifiable, and making the brands and the creators kind of like accountable for the information that they're putting out there, right? That if you are you know, faking your data or you're greenwashing or you're doing things that you shouldn't do, you are putting those statements out there and then they might come back to get you in the future, right? So you definitely will incentivize a level of transparency and good behavior also, right? So that help us build the, the, the trust relationship with the brands. So that's like the first part. And this is an existing problem. This is also a problem. The problem around counterfeiting, the problem around, you know, uh, having information about your product, being able to verify it in the, in the future that the product is not a, an authentic piece, all of these problems, all of the, all of the sudden are, are, are solved. But then when we created this digital, all of the sudden we are realizing that a, a significant amount of the value of the product is in the intangibles. So kind of like that next progression goes around the full dematerialization of the product when we start thinking about only a digital only product. Right, where we take effectively that 90% abstracted and forget about the physical one. And then we have a digital product that exists only in a digital space and is meant to be experienced only in a digital environment. And that's kind of like the next progression. And obviously, when we're talking about a digital only product, the ownership, how it's managed, the ownership of that product is super important. And right now, you know, the only the only solution that we have towards owning digital goods is blockchain technology, right? So the best solution is just basically creating an identifier for that digital good in the form of an NFT or, uh, or a token, um, a fungible token, and then basically there you have it. You own it, you can transact it, and that product, the ownership of that product should be the way, gateway of access to an infinite array of experiences. And that's kind of like the opposite dynamic of what we have today with digital goods, especially in gaming. That basically the destination is the starting point and then you can get assets within that destination, right? But um, I don't know, I think that will never work in the real world. And, you know, we love the products, we want the products, we want to own them. And then we want to take our things, our stuff to different places and not be limited by the place. So I think that's the that's the... That's, that is the gap that blockchain technology can really bridge. So it's around the ownership and management of, of a digital product, as well as the management and ownership of your own personal identity on a digital space. Okay, so now I'm thinking how to parallel what you're saying with like, let's say current, current way of consuming, collecting, buying, living with fashion, for example. So let's say that I go, I go to a secondhand store or I go to, I don't know, whatever shop and I buy a garment and I bring it home and I wear it on my body and I keep it in the wardrobe. This is a very simplistic, you know, simple everyday life definition of a what is a relationship we have with garments, not looking at the production, not looking at their cultural meaning. 
but I'm very interested in this element of kind of ownership and how it's, you know, the physical aspect of ownership, because this is what's very different, right, with digital fashion and with blockchain. So, so thinking about from the perspective, and this is some questions that uh, my students very often pose when we discuss uh, uh, blockchain digital fashion, they say, okay, but why would I buy it? Who buys it? Uh, and where do you keep it? And what do you do with it? Right? So wow. there's this yeah. typical question of who, why, and what is the function? Because obviously fashion, on one hand, there are things we want to have. There are also things that have function we want to wear. So how do you usually respond to this question about you know, uh, storing and uh, function? Yeah, that's awesome. And I think it's, it's easier than what we do in real life. I think in the future, people will be in awe about the extents of what we do for our physical stuff. Uh, our digital stuff is definitely way more low maintenance. Like I think if, I don't know, aliens will come from space and see, you know, uh, what us taking our garments to the laundry, pick them up, take them back, put it in a closet, having storage winter, summer, they will be perplexed about the efforts that we make in order to look different <laughs> and express ourselves. Uh, so like the I days, assume that they don't do that. I like, I like that well, well, they are aliens, they do not dry clean. This is yeah, yeah, they, oh, for sure, they have better technology than like trying to catch the dye and dry cleaner open, which seems to require superpowers because my dry cleaner, every time I try to pass by, is always closed, either yeah. for delivering or picking up. Um, but enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> so no dry cleaning required in the metaverse so the 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 storage in part is very simple and this is one of the things that Luxo has solved and the, the we've been working on for the last couple of years is basically first you having control of your personal id your personal profile on chain so we call the solution which is an array of like uh, different smart contracts we call it the universal profile so under that profile that profile is your access First of all, it's your, your blockchain identifier. So it's your address in the one hand. Um, it's the place from where you can issue a token, you can issue an NFT, um, and you can also receive them. So basically all you have to do is take care of your profile. And as long as you have access to your profile and you're maintaining it, you can, you can store your NFTs in there. So it's a bit of like connoisseurship in a way, like that's the place where you collect them. It's like your trophy cabinet for, for your digital goods. So you have them there. And you keep them, and if you don't want them, you burn them, you gift them, you do whatever you want with them. But you keep them on that profile. So they exist digitally in there, and that's how you, the way you view them and, 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 you, and you see what you want. So that's pretty much it. So you just have to maintain your universal profile. And that universal profile, you can have several profiles for, you know, different things like you you know you do different activities on chain and online and you want to have a couple of different personas and you can maintain all of those and then those different identities can collect different assets so that's one thing so a profile just in the same way we keep pictures in instagram you will have a profile where you keep your nfts and then in terms of post purchase utility i think this is like the holy grail of uh, digital consumption right now because we have as we were saying before, we have like two disjointed arms. We have uh, kind of like the wall gardens of, of, of gaming in the one hand, and then we have the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is, uh, there's a massive creative output, people are producing assets, and all of a sudden it's like, where do we experience them? So I think we will see a massive amount of emergence of like games and very powerful and they will become very powerful players. They're open, meaning they take assets from the outside. We will have this, the hardware that will allow us to see things in augmented reality on a daily basis and in a, in a daily life uh, rather. And then I think it goes to the post-purchase experience. I think the, the, the ultimate post-purchase that we want is to be able to experience that in a juxtaposition with the real world. So that's number one. But there's an array of different, like we can take it to a game the open world gardens, they allow us to take it. Some of the other games don't allow, but I think that's a progression that will happen. And then the tradability is still a very, very attractive proposition. And then just basically the ability to collect it in the same way we, 
people collected stamps and coins and baseball cards in the past. This is just about the collectability. So that's like a, those different places, right? And obviously the ability to juxtapose it into your physical body and share it in social media is, is a lot of fun. So I think all of those different like mediums of expression uh, are amazing for sports experiences, but not only like I think, and this is a, a key difference between the digital product and the digital to what we know today as regular physical products is the fact that all of a sudden that NFT, that ownership of that product becomes a gateway to an experience. So it might be not necessarily me wearing it or me, my direct relationship with the product, but it might be all of a sudden the product gives me access to the next drop or the product gives me access to this exclusive sale, or it gives me access to an event, or it gives me access to get a mentorship with a person. You know, so all of a the sudden, the, the product is not only about the product itself, but it's also by all of them, what it represents to have that ownership. And all of a sudden, you know, brands can know like how passionate you are and how long are you holding the products and how you don't resell, for example, how you are so much of a hodler of that specific brand. And all of a sudden, that can give you a benefit. So I think it's that accessibility that is that is come with it that is going to be very attractive for a lot of consumers and for all of us in the future. Okay, interesting. And maybe from this we can jump to fashion NFTs and what you're doing with Tmap. So this yeah. is your second project. So yes, tell me what do you what do you do there and uh, how in the most simple way do you explain it? What it yes, is? so. Dematerialize is meant to, to, to fill a massive gap in the market that is to be the destination for discovering and experiencing of digital fashion uh, products and yeah, fashion goods that exist only digitally in the form of, of NFTs. Um, and basically it's a, a space that is curated in which you know we have a selection of products and we work really hard to make sure those products have as much cross-purchase utility as possible. So the Dematerialize was born while I was working already on Luxo. We were like two years inside inside the Luxo game. And you know, we Fabian and I were both very, very passionate about digital goods in general. Obviously, that's why we got into blockchain technology. That's why we did Luxo or we are doing Luxo. Um, but obviously the digital fashion kind of like topic, it, it was very central in our research at Luxo, but it was not Fabian's like passion uh, topic. He's more, you know, he's very passionate about the gaming world and, and digitalization of goods in the general, but not so much into digital fashion specifically. And I knew that all of the tools that we're building, they will power dozens and hundreds of marketplaces in the future. And I was just literally bad desperate to build one of those marketplaces. I was like, I want to make one, uh, but I knew I couldn't do it myself. I knew it was too much for, 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 for Luxo to take upon. And, and then very luckily, Karina and I, also around two years ago, two years ago, I met a lot of interesting people. Uh, we, met, uh, we met in a conference in Paris and we stay in touch. We, we had a follow-up meeting in London where she was living back then. Um, and then we decided in a coffee, we're having a coffee in the Hoxton in Shortridge to, to start this venture. We share a very similar vision for, for the market, a similar passion. So we decided to create this marketplace to, to become the destination and to make it very easy for designers to kind of like go to market, right? From taking their creations that at this point just exist like 3D assets, you know, and take them basically to the market and have that little like digital manufacturing facility for them. So that's what the dematerialize is. And now we, we launch for the first time in, in December, 2020. We decided to start the venture in March, 2020. So no, in February, 2020, we incorporated in March and then the world went to a, into a lockdown. Mm. And then Karina and I, we were trying to strategize how, how do we build this when we cannot see each other because she was uh, relocating to Ibiza at that point in time. And then uh, around the summertime or post the summer, we figured out a good way and we came with a good strategy. And then uh, we went into close beta in December and since then we have done quite, quite regular drops. Um, this week is happening our eighth drop. So 
Cool. So, yeah. What kind of, so what kind of drops you already had? You had already, because each of them is based kind of on, let's say it's like a collaboration, right? That you yes. A drop with a certain brand. So uh, could you, I don't know, what was your favorite one? Because I also wanted to ask you about, you know, what's your virtual style and do you collect, you know, do you collect fashion NFTs and, you know, have you bought any lately? I also would be curious to hear about that. Oh, very nice. So I, I basically try to get my hands into everything that Immaterialize sells. To be quite frank, we don't always manage to get our hands into some of the product, which sounds crazy because we deploy the cell and we ourselves don't get, get in, uh, into get the product sometimes because we're very lucky there's a high demand. So uh, I love everything that we have dropped in the Dematerialize. I think the Rebecca Minkoff uh, collection was very beautiful because it opened kind of like the doors of this uh, a different a different audience that we didn't we were not addressing so much before in terms of like I think the Karl Lagerfeld dolls are incredibly iconic and unique and such a special historical moment. We feel very fortunate that we are the ones who 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 got to do this with them. Um, and of course we have done uh, super cool things like Soland and of course uh, Artifact Studios and one of my personal favorites, if not my personal favorite, to be quite frank, and um, Ninjas in Pyjamas. So Karina and I and our team with Alex and everybody else, the team, we, you know, we are trying to always address the three consumer group, groups that we see. Mm -hmm. It is obviously the crypto consumer who loves, understands digital goods. And, you know, they're at this point, they're mostly male users and consumers, so identify as males, but they're still very passionate about digital goods. Um, oh, that's the main passion actually. And then the second group is the gamers who also understand digital goods since decades and they're used to purchasing digital goods on a daily basis. Uh, but NFTs is like a new type of consumption for them. And then the third group is the fashion consumer. And that's somehow the toughest not to crack because the fashion consumer is used to a very high fidelity quality of experience, right? And then it, it, the, the conversion uh, process is a, bit, is a bit more difficult and it takes, takes a bit more work. But this is like moments like the Rebecca Minkoff uh, collaboration with Sean, bringing that real like traditional kind of like fashion touch to the to the whole digital fashion space. And I think it, it really supports on that conversion uh, process that we are attempting. Mm, yeah, I think this first group is very interesting. And it also kind of leads into the next thing I wanted to ask you about. In you publish a very interesting, very short, but very kind of powerful text in March in Medium. And it was, wait, let me read the title. It's called Cultural Ultra, Ultra Light Paper, Fashion World in Our Newly Decentralized World. And I really like that you use the word fashion worlds as written together uh, because I was like, oh my God, it's amazing why I didn't come up myself with it. Because when I was writing my PhD, I'm quoting this one um, guy, his name is Arturo Escobar and he wrote the book Design for the Pluriverse. So it's all about inclusivity and you know, for the many. And he talks about the design that it has a world making capacity. So that design makes worlds. And you know, and in my, in my research and my unpublished chapter, I wrote, um, if fashion has the power to create new worlds, what are they? So I was I was thinking like, what else, where does those fashion worlds as one word come from? Like, uh, what does that mean to you? Oh, that's awesome. I think, you know, when we were back then in March, when we were thinking about it and we were discussing a lot, like the, all of the sudden, like digital fashion enter this Excel, like it, the hockey stick. I mean, we're still in the, bare bottom of that hockey stick but it really was a massive we gained massively momentum you know partially due to the the global pandemic through the lockdown you know but it eventually you know just created this it became part of the cultural conversation and if this became you know part of the mainstream cultural conversation so it all of the sudden accelerated and i think you know we were talking about fashion world it's just all of the sudden i think and we take, you know, regardless of taste, I think one can take Virgil Abloh, like an amazing example of somebody that through almost like his transgressions that he creates between disciplines. And obviously he has very clear design strategies. They're very recognizable. And those design strategies kind of like translate to many kind of like mediums and 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 uh, and products and means of expression, et cetera, uh, through that transgression. And he achieves this convergence that it 
just creates this very clear world. Like we all know how a virtual upload world will look like. It's full of Sharpies and orange and, you know, like this clamor that we use in design school. And, you know, we, we, we know it, we can visualize it, right? You could potentially create a whole room uh, very easily. They will feel like his universe, right? And this is because he's, he's breaking these barriers, right? So he used his visual language as a strategy for storytelling and he's magnificent at translating this into anything, into a Evian bottle, into a car, to a carpet, high fashion, whatever it might be, right? So regardless if one likes his aesthetics or not, or one appreciate his craftsmanship or not, there is a very interesting point in the fact that you know how that universe will look like. And I think now with this massive and true digital transformation that we are living, we know that we can create this universe, right? And this is kind of like what people have dreamed about. Like mm -hmm. we all wanted to be immersed. And I think that's why fashion shows, the magnificent fashion shows are so exciting because it's like you really get sort of transported in, into this, this world of this brand. Like a Chanel show is like a, is so, such a spectacular moment. So I think all of a sudden through digital technologies, we have that ability of creating this 100% in like 100% immersive experience in which, you know, it's not limited to one type of product. It's not limited to one asset class, but it can, that visual language and that, and that the spirit of that brand can be translated into pretty much everything. And I think brands will have, they, and it's, it's already like that, but they have almost this necessity of being, being an experience agency and making sure that offering that experience to to the people who follows them and who likes them and you know to quote david fisher he said a couple of years ago uh brands are the new bands like how kids in the 60s and in the 90s used to be frenetic about a band is what kids today are about brands like they stand outside in the line for supreme drops like they just love the brands is the brand more than the bands used to be for for a different generation so i think that that desire of being fully immersed in the in, in the vision of a of a creator i think is super exciting so i think that those fa those fashion those fashion worlds will be part of the evolution in which you know we have that real convergence between digital and physical and we will be entering very exciting territories hmm. but with virtual blood there's also a lot of you know, criticism and a lot of uh, conversation going on about appropriation and the way not only how he deals with aesthetics, but also how he deals with, you know, social values and those aspects. So maybe that would be interesting to think like how actually, you know, you work with the, I don't know, because this is something that's very interesting to me in my work, the social, political, environmental aspects of fashion. Um, and this is also something when I'm talking about digital fashion, I'm concerned sometimes about it's how the harmful fast fashion logic can be applied to digital fashion. So Absolutely. I'm curious, is this something that you discuss internally? You know, what are your guiding principles? And it doesn't also have to be only fast fashion because there are also luxury houses that struggle with that. So you they, know they, they don't, yeah, they don't necessarily have great business practices. That is, that is for sure. I mean, I think one one of the one of the power and one of the beautiful things about this hub web three movement movement and, and blockchain technology is that it implies and demands for a certain level of transparency. So yeah. I think certain behavior, you know, it will just not be acceptable anymore. Not that it was ever acceptable, but it's the fact that certain statements are put in public, right? And you know, a lot of people they might feel comfortable lying in a controlled environment. But most people, I mean, besides certain politicians, uh, they don't feel comfortable, for example, lying in a very public fashion. So I think when you all of a sudden, you, you know that the information that you put it out there um, is part and accessible to the community, you will have a bit of, hopefully, a bit more of respect around about what you're doing. And you know, I think the consumer will demand um, a certain level of quality and moral standards in order to support a product. Otherwise, the, the consumer will no longer stand behind those brands. So I think there is a there's a level of transparency that is kind of like de facto with blockchain and Web3 technologies. But I think, you know, when it comes to uh, having fast fashion or bad, 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 um, 
bad fashion practices or bad practices by environmental practices translating into the digital world you know we already know that obviously you know everything costs something and always somebody has to do something in order to to put any piece of work out there i think you know when it comes to the fashion good itself we know with a digital fashion garment we are significantly several magnitudes more sustainable than with a physical good because ours what it will be constitute your sample is your final product and it's your whole production line right in a physical world you have a, a sample that's the beginning of the whole process and the whole uh, impact into the environment digital is the opposite you made one you made a billion and that's it obviously there's energy costs around it but i think we will have I think you know there's still a lot of, of data in progress and, and potentially you know more about this than me, Beata, but you know, people say around 90% more sustainable. I think when we enter a proper economy of scale with digital fashion, we will see that number is actually even more dramatic in terms of like the the analog of those of those digital products will be way, way more, more impactful. So I think you know the risk comes um. For example, one of the things that the dematerialized doesn't do is like this um, manually dressing of people in digital garments because somebody needs to do that work. And in order to do that work properly, it is quite time consuming. So it will take a couple of hours. And if you have a really good designer sitting there a couple of hours, then you are spending 300, 400, 500 euros into dress somebody into a digital garment. Mm -hmm. And in order to put that price tag lower, make it accessible for a regular consumer, means somebody is getting underpaid, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody is Photoshopping these images and not getting properly uh, compensated. So that's why the dematerialized, we don't do that. And I think a lot of these problems would be solved with technology, right? So what we need to invest is our money and our time and our technology and the research and development is to make sure that technology takes over uh, the the cumbersome tasks you know and then you don't have creative humans doing jobs that they shouldn't be doing uh, mm -hmm. and not getting um, uh, properly compensated so i think it's identifying what are the pain points in terms of like how do we make sure that we enter an economy of scale that is powered by technology and is not powering by underpaying other humans like that's a very important thing and right now our economy has been built in especially you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a clear dominance of the Western world versus the, the, the non-developed world in terms of like people getting underpaid, somebody's not getting paid properly, somebody's suffering, somebody's working extra hours. Then there's things such as the child labor, horrible conditions, because somebody's making money out of that suffering. Somebody's getting the cut out of that human tax that we're paying mm -hmm. so i think making sure that we don't, don't we don't repeat those mistakes and that we build a messy amazing highly profitable economies of scale that are powered by technology i think that's the that's the end game that's the goal mm, that's cool yeah i had a student that was uh, she's very interested in uh, social sustainability so workers mm -hmm. rights and she goes to factories in india and italy uh and oh, wow. she makes sure that you know manufacturers basically are humans are seen and they're happy. It obviously poses many difficulties, but she is very kind of informed by, I don't know, philosophical and feminist texts about love and care. Uh, understand it on a slightly different level than just romantic love between two or more people. Uh, but it's very interesting because now I started thinking how, you know, those notions of social sustainability could be inserted in fashion tech companies. So that's also something that I think we will see more and more uh, in the future. But that, I think, is a topic for another yeah. podcast. Yeah, thank you yeah. so thank you so much for talking to me, Marjorie. It was yeah, a pleasure. Uh, Likewise, Beata. To the new drops and, you know, how both Luxo and DMAT together in Fusion will be developing. Yeah, and definitely the sustainability factor and uh, all of that is very important for us, especially for the dematerialized. That's why we have hired a stellar uh, sustainability officer who we will announce very soon. So yeah, it's definitely a big, big topic of, of, of interest for us. Very important. Okay. To our Looking work. forward to it. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Beata. <laughs>